Let me introduce our moderator for this webinar. Um, Danielle Gould is the founder of Food Tech Connect, an information company that connects innovators at the intersection of food and information technology. Her expertise includes food systems, urban agriculture, open government, open research, the semantic web, open innovation, social entrepreneurship, and social media. Danielle consults on data strategy, digital brand management, consumer engagement, strategic investment and collaboration. I, I want you all to keep her very busy. Make sure you ask lots and lots of questions. Danielle. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, as Jeff explained, uh, Food Tech Connect is a media company um, that whose goal is to connect decision makers with the information that um, they need and the people they need to fuel food system innovation. And the reason that we do this is because we believe that information and technology can really bring transparency, economic growth, accelerated innovation, equity, and sustainability to the food supply chain. And um, so I'm really excited about the panel that we have today because everybody is working on um, different aspects of all of these things. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format of today, um, and then we will move on to presentations. Um, so each of the panelists is going to have about five minutes to give a brief uh, overview of their tools and an explanation of how they are um, removing barriers to increase, uh, removing barriers to increase sustainable food in the food system. They will also be talking about why they think that their approach is an effective way to increase regional food. And last, I'll be talking about the, their business model. After that, we'll have about a half an hour to discuss uh, for all of your questions. Um, and with that, we will move on. This is an overview of the five tools that we'll be uh, focusing on. They are um, looking at various aspects of the food system. So, um, Ag Squared is looking at uh, farm management. Top 10 Produce is looking at uh, consumer uh, traceability, farm to consumer traceability. Uh, Idaho Bounty and Local Orbit are both um, food hub management systems. Idaho Bounties is open source, and we'll go into a little more detail about what that means. And um, retail, real time farms has created a a database of good food producers and purveyors, and they make it easy for um, consumers to find out more information about where their food is being produced. So to start, uh, we will be uh, talking to um, Julia Solari, who is a co-founder of Ag Squared. Um, Julia um, co-founded Ag Squared along with um, Jeff Reich and Gordon. Uh, to bring farm planning, management, and record-keeping tools to small farmers. The inspiration for Ag Squared was born while she and Jeff were in graduate school at Cornell, where they both worked in a plant breeding lab and spent many evenings together discussing agriculture and technology. While at Cornell, uh, Julia uh, researched the biochemistry and genetics of um, pregnancy, that is the hotness in peppers, receiving a PhD in plant molecular biology and genetics in 2009. Her fascination with plants began while working in a lab as an undergraduate at Harvard, which grows into a fascination in crop diversity and production. So I will pass it on to Julia. Okay. Thank you, Danielle, for that introduction. I'm really glad to be here today. So to introduce Ag Squared, I think it makes sense to start off by talking about small farms. Small farms are critical to our food system. They serve as local repositories of crop diversity, they provide land stewardship, they preserve green spaces, and as members of the community, farmers can be the economic engines of small towns. But even if we all agree that small farms are valuable to the food system, it doesn't change the fact that being a small farmer is hard. And their existence in our agricultural landscape is by no means a given. Small farms tend to be really susceptible to the unpredictability of the environment in the marketplace. They have a hard time accessing capital and complying with food safety regulations. And for these and many other reasons and challenges, small and mid-sized farm, 
end up going out of business at the rate of more than 300 per week. That's a pretty large number. So we believe that this is a big problem for our food system. And what our food system needs is for solutions to the problems that growers face so that we can help more small farms stay in business and more farmers start small farms. What we've discovered is that the key to sustainable farms, and I mean the word sustainable here in every sense of the word, is having good records. In a nutshell, what records do is that they help farmers understand what is going on on the farm, what practices work and which ones don't, what varieties grow well, how much labor a farm needs, what crops are most profitable. So farm records are important to the food system also because they help aggregators and farmers better understand supply and demand. And ultimately, without good records, it's hard to measure sustainability on the farm and make a farm productive without relying on chemical inputs. So despite farm records being exceedingly important, record keeping on the farm isn't easy, and for it to be done right, a farmer really needs to have some tools. So if you're a large grower, what you can use are any of the number of sophisticated software programs that help manage production and keep track of inputs and outputs and sales. Um, and this is the kind of software that helps large growers achieve the uh, productivity and profitability of their operations. Small growers, on the other hand, haven't really had access to the same kinds of tools that would match their workflow. And it's not like you can take the software that is used on large farms and bring it to small farms and expect it to work, because small farms aren't just the junior version of large farms, so to speak. So what we're doing at AgSquared is building an online software tool that helps small growers keep accurate and timely farm records, manage their farm businesses with greater ease, and ultimately do more with less. And the way that we do this is by uh, making it easier for growers to keep effective records. So for a grower to keep farm records effectively, it means that the farmer has to build a lot of redundancy into the day-to-day -day record keeping practices. So that's because the information about any one particular crop that might be important could be found in the crop plan, on the farm map, in the production schedule, in harvest records, in the farm journal. Anyway, you, you get the idea, right? It's, it's spread out all over the place. And when records are kept on paper, the information would need to be hand copied from one format to another if you want to draw any conclusion about the effectiveness of your farming practices. And so in the end, you'll end up having to leaf through and look through records that are organized, let's say by date, when what you really need to be looking at them is organized by crop. So overall, this inefficient system means that most growers don't end up keeping sufficient records. In Ag Squared, on the other hand, what you do is you enter information only once, and that's when you create your crop plan. And then not only does the information automatically show up where you need it to show up, in your map, in your calendar, and so on, but at the end of the season, the information that you've collected in the journal will end up being organized by crop in the crop planner. And what this does is it helps a grower make decisions in the next year. On top of that, AgSquared is designed to help growers manage the diversity on their farms. So as I mentioned earlier, small farms and large farms are not just you know, one the larger version of the other. Small farms tend to have a greater variety and number of crops that are planted per acre. Large farms tend to eliminate this diversity in order to achieve their economies of scale in that high productivity, high efficiency model. But what we do is we help growers manage the diversity so that they can make their businesses productive and profitable without sacrificing sustainability. And what we believe that this means, and why this is important for the food system, is that it's more local food grown with care for more people. For those who are concerned about Ag Squared's sustainability, so not the sustainability of the farm, but of us as a business, our business model is based on helping growers do more with less by improving grower profitability and productivity. And we derive our profits from this improvement in efficiency. So our basic production planning and management platform is free. It's currently being beta tested by 50 growers. That beta test is expected to expand pretty soon. And we expect to launch the software sometime this fall or winter. To the free software, we aim to add business uh, subscription-based business management features that growers can use to keep track of costs and sales and that will give them detailed analytics that help them improve their bottom lines. And we plan to support our free production planning and management platform through targeted advertising and sponsorships. We believe that with Ag Squared, we now have an opportunity, an opportunity to positively impact the food supply chain by using on re online farm records to simplify the business processes that occur on the farm and downstream of the farm. So for example, online farm records can provide produce aggregators with information on how much growers expect to produce and how much is available.
Online farm records can be used to help growers market their crops, obtain certification and compliance standards, for example, organic certification, and help consumers learn more about the origins and the practices that were used to produce their food. Our goal is to work with partners to make the farm records that are collected in Ag Squared available to those who can help growers make use of them. So to wrap up what I'm saying today, if we believe that more small farms are important to building a good food system, then it is important that we build and promote tools that help keep small farms in business. We already have more than 2,200 growers who have signed up to use Ag Squared when we launch, and we're working with farm support organizations, some of which you see on the screen in front of you, to help make sure that even more growers find out about and adopt Ag Squared this year. Our network of partner organizations is growing, and if you feel that your constituents would benefit from knowing about and accessing Ag Squared, we would love it if you would get in touch with us. Um, and thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. So our next panelist is John Bailey from Top 10 Produce. John Bailey is an attorney advocate for independent growers. In 2009, uh, Bailey created Top 10 Produce LLC to serve as a brand holding company for an exclusively local brand, Top 10. The local Top 10 brand allowed otherwise independent-minded local growers in the Salinas Valley to legally join forces to achieve economies of scale. By unifying under a common brand, these independent local growers market themselves to local consumers through social media accessed by uh, smartphone applications capable of scanning item level barcodes. Top 10 Produce LLC has since grown this concept nationwide under a regional brand called Locale with the help of a competitive small business innovation research grant awarded by the USDA and with generous complimentary marketing support provided by Shop Savvy Inc the creator of the Shop Savvy, the number one mobile shopping application for smartphones globally. Uh, and John, you want to? Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. Um, as she said, I serve as an advocate for a national network of growers. So what that means is uh, we don't, do not buy produce. We do not sell produce. It's very important we don't uh, touch any portion of the producer's uh, income stream. What we do is we promote our growers <coughs> through the a know your farmer, know your food marketing concept by using our traceability technology to connect the consumer to the grower at the point of sale. Um, so uh, in this new wave of technology, you, you can't do it all yourself. You have to form alliances. That's basically what we're trying to do. Uh, as an advocate, uh, we're just trying to form alliances between these growers and between technology companies that want to have groups of growers to work with. So the way we do the traceability at the item level with the initial local brand top 10, there was actually a GS1 data bar, which is the small barcode you see there, it was on every single item. By allowing the data bar to go from a single farm to a single store, it could be 100% traceable throughout the supply chain because that number never changed. Also, consumers could scan that barcode and they could be connected to information that was specific about the grower and that particular location, that particular farm. Uh, difficulty is when wholesalers are buying, oops, I've gone too far. When wholesalers are buying, they want to buy from uh, groups of growers, so we developed the locale brand. Uh, this is a, an example of a Salinas Valley strawberry group, 10 growers, and they all sell under the individual label, but when you scan that label with Shop Savvy, uh, as you see on there, what you'll see is you'll see the actual grower that grew the berries that are in that particular barcode. Now that grower is incentivized to post on social media because now he's able to, to give his berries a buying preference over other growers in the group if he has a connection with those local consumers. So um, Shop Savvy, if, if uh, you see on the left here, uh, it can allow uh, consumers in an area to look at different stores to see pricing for products. It can allow the consumer to see wholesale uh, online, um, and also you see the little Know Your Farmer link there down at the bottom. That's what allows you to know, uh, who, you know which farmer, which farmer of the 10 uh, put the clamshells in that strawberry. So if you see the, the one on the right, when the consumer will tap that Know Your Farmer, they'll see that thing there that's on the right. And what that does is that allows the consumer to, be, to begin to build a relationship with the grower, even if they're shipping it all the way across the country, because many of these growers they ship these to, to East Coast, but there's still a Know Your Farmer feel 
that you have uh, otherwise with local produce. Um, so the key to creating leverage between independent farms and independent databases like Ag Squared um, is to be able to connect the consumer to the data because that data has marketing advantages or to be able to connect the wholesaler to the data. Uh, the way you do that is with GS1 standardized data carriers. So the Produce Traceability Initiative is requiring these small growers to use these GTINs, which are Global Trade Identification Numbers, and GLNs, which are Global Location Numbers. Um, basically, they put that data in, and that connects all the data along the supply chain in a way that they can recall produce uh, if there's a food safety incident. But what we do is we allow uh, our technology partners, like Shop Savvy, to actually use that data uh, for marketing purposes. Um, what you have here is uh, a couple of the uh, marketing alliances that we're currently working with, uh, with the concept of accepting mobile payments. There's a big opportunity for mobile payments. Uh, again, we're not going to take a piece of the action, but what uh, you can do when you group a large number of independent growers together and you put all their mobile payments in a single location, you can actually save a lot of money because it's typically 3% of someone's buying a product through a mobile wallet at farmer's market, but if uh, you can hit a million dollars a year, then there's a 1% savings. Uh, that savings can go to use uh, to, to fund things like Market Maker in order to allow Market Maker to make connections uh, between small independent growers or grower groups under the locale brand and wholesale buyers. Um, the other uh, interesting thing is I, I think a lot of people Number one, they think that we're a, a distribution company, which we're not. We don't buy and sell. But they also think that all we are is a brand. Uh, we do have a brand, but the reason is is those GS1 numbers are brand specific. So if we're working with growers that don't have a GS1 number, we need to have a brand to unite them to sell under. But we also have allied brands. Uh, the example I have here is an allied brand called Farm Pack, uh, started by a gentleman named Carson Barnes in North Carolina. He's got 5,000 acres of uh, sweet potatoes that he's selling in Asia. And apparently they want to know that they come from North Carolina. Uh, so he has actually joined our program and he's using our locale labels in order to source identify the Farm Pack brand to the to the three counties, in, or it's five counties, pardon me, in North Carolina, uh, where they're sourced from. Um, so basically the uh, first slide was a, a quote by the richest man in the world. Uh, his name is Carlos Slim. And uh, he says, in this new wave of technology, you cannot do it all. You have to form alliances. And so the thing that I uh, remind myself is, what do we do? And I think as important as what we do is what we do not do. And what we don't do is we don't take a piece of the pie that any of our allies use for their income streams. So we don't buy and sell produce, and we don't, uh, we don't do databases. We really connect people, and uh, we provide the traceability uh, that connects those databases. That's it. Hello? Great. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hello? Okay. We can hear you. Uh, okay. Next we have uh, Laura Tice, who um, is with Idaho's Bounty. Laura's upbringing um, is in a small farming town in western Wisconsin, which led her to uh, value landscapes, the outdoors, and community involvement. After finishing a BS in landscape architecture at um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison through an, America, an AmeriCorps position at um, Ketchum, Idaho, Laura has brought back full circle to farmers and community she grew up with. An integral founding member of Idaho's Bounty Co-op, Laura works with the co-op in, in member services producer and producer communication training. She continues to help develop software systems that support the online food market of Idaho's Bounty. Laura? Thank you, Danielle. We're excited to be a part of this webinar here and really excited to hear um, all the local food solutions that people are putting together. So this is a screenshot of our homepage here. Um, as Danielle said, I am a founding member of Idaho's Bounty. Um, we had a C local CSA here that dissolved uh, end of 2006, and there was a, a need in our community to fill the void uh, left by that CSA. So we did a small survey of our local community with some nonprofits uh, email lists, 
and we found out that the, the community here was really interested in still getting local food. Um, after a visit to Oklahoma Food Co-op in early 2007, we decided to start emailing some Excel spreadsheets around from some of our farmers. We found that a really, really inefficient system for everybody involved, a lot of time, um, a lot of mistakes. And so from our visit to Oklahoma, we found their open source software and decided to go into business with the open source software in the fall of 2007. And we have been in business moving food ever since then. So this is a little bit about our co-op. We are both owned by producers and customers. We currently have about 74 producer members, 790 retail members, and 26 wholesale members. And our focus is to develop a sustainable and seamless food distribution system for local foods in southern Idaho. So we were able to start um, with funding from the Farmers Market Promotion Program grant through the USDA and numerous private donations um, that help us purchase vehicles. Uh, the first couple of years, we did have a lot of in-kind staff donations to help get the, the staffing started. Um, throughout the years, we have received continued grant funding and private do donations for about $80,000 per year. We've continued to develop the software systems that we have, um, both the back end and the visuals, and have continued to do that through grants and private donations. And currently, we are supporting ourselves um, about half of our operating expenses with our sales. And I'll go into a little bit more detail later about kind of our, our break even and where we're aiming to get. So just a little bit of the geography of Idaho before I go too much further. Um, Idaho is a really, really big state in the West, and there's um, not a whole lot more towns than what's shown on this map here. Um, our distances are really far apart, and so our farmers have a really hard time getting their food to the customers. Um, a farmer's market here means driving two and a half hours and you know, being there all day, and so we, we really wanted to become the transportation solution for getting, helping them get their food to market. Um, what we also found from a bunch of our farmers is that they'd prefer to be on the farm and not spending the time marketing. So in both the transportation and the marketing, we saw uh, a need to fill. So why we decided to go online rather than emailing our Excel spreadsheets was uh, one for a matter of efficiency. And we went with the open source software that Oklahoma was using at that time um, because of the low overhead. It was not much more than needed to um, than to hire a developer for a few hours to put our name on it and get our producers in there. Um, I'm going to take a little side note here to explain what open source is. Um, anyone is able to study, change, and improve the software. And open source software is often developed in a collaborative manner, which fell right in the line with our cooperative form of business. So the open source software, as I said, was a really pretty easy startup. We were able to get off the ground really quickly with that. And it's a great way to pull together numerous different partners uh, across a large geographic region, which Idaho definitely is. One of the biggest things that we get from our farmers is that the, all the orders are pre-sold through Idaho Bounty. So they then know at the start, at the close of our cycle, how, many, how much food they can send to other markets or other venues that they sell through. So it's really definitely helped them to manage their quantity and their supply of, of what needs to go where since all the orders through us are pre-sold. Um, it's a great way to compile a lot of relationships and a lot of information on both producers, customers, um, all together in one place. And we've, we've really found that helpful because there's so many different moving pieces involved. It's a great way to bring that together. And our pickup model, so basically our truck route goes through and picks up all the food from the farmers on a three days a week. And then we go through and sort that, count it, and then get it back out to our customers. And in our customers, we have several different pickups. And that pickup model allows different groups that are already formed, such as a school, a church, something that already has a cohesive group, does, we, are, it, we can then bring the food directly to, to their already organized site. And that model allows for a lot of growth because we're not trying to sort and count all of the food individually. So just a quick summary of who we are and what we do on a weekly basis. Um, we have more farmers than this, but about 45 farmers per week uh, provide their food to us. They do all of their own listings, so we just kind of monitor that, make sure things are, are looking all okay. But they put all their own prices up. They 
businesses manage all of their own inventory. So then from those 45 farmers, we provide weekly retail pickups for 120 customers roughly, and we have about eight different pickup sites. And we've now just moved this summer to twice a weekly delivery for wholesale accounts um, for about 15 different restaurants, five grocery stores, and one retail market associated with Idaho's Bounty. We provide uh, payouts to our producers once a month. Um, for bookkeeping reasons, we've decided to go once a month and have found that works really well with our farmers. And in 2010, we had gross sales of about 482000 And we've grown at a rate of about 25% in sales per year since we opened in 2007. So where do we go from here, and how are we aiming to be a sustainable um, company? We project um, that we need to hit $1.3 million at current expenses to break even. And so we're, we're on track to hit that in the end of 2012 with the current growth rate. And we're, the wholesale sales that we have done this summer are really pushing us uh, a lot closer to that. Um, the great thing about open source software for us is that we've really been able to learn a lot about our business and what works and what doesn't with a rel relatively low software cost. And as we have grown as a business, we can continue to develop and change that software to what best fits our needs. Um, we've also found that some retail and wholesale customers really still want that face-to-face, -face, either with the farmer or with us as an order venue. And so in that case, we use the online software as our invoicing system. Um, and something we'd like to talk about uh, later in the question and answer session, we recently hired a developer to research a lot of the online model or food hub distribution that are functional and useful in the United States. Um, so he's in the process of doing that research right now. And we'd love to talk to um, anybody that's interested in either, that either has a model or is interested in helping to develop a model um, with greater capacity for wholesale and software that handles multiple overlapping cycles. And what I mean by that is that we could deliver wholesale, say, three days a week, and retail maybe one or two, um, but the farmers wouldn't have, would have an easy time managing inventory and managing their sales. So um, we're going to hear from Logo Orbit now. They're very doing similar to work to what we are, so I'm sure you'll get some great information from them as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Erica Block from Local Orbit. Uh, Erica is the founder of Local Orbit, a web service that makes it easy for people to buy and sell food. Local Orbit provides online marketing, sales, logistics, and inventory management for food hubs, entrepreneurs, farmers, institutions, and community groups working to increase local and regional food distribution. Local Orbit's back office tools help people leverage their existing physical resources and networks. Buyers get streamlined purchasing from multiple sellers and a direct traceable supply chain. Everyone gets a more efficient, equitable, and sustainable food system. Prior to Local Orbit, Erica founded and ran an entrepreneurial arts organization overseeing programming, board development, marketing, and financial management. She managed cross-sector partnerships and projects in the U.S., Great Britain, and South Africa. Erica also led the renovation of a vacant building in Detroit into a theater, gallery, and bar, working with vendors to source local food for events. Throughout her career, she has created collaborative environments that facilitate learning and action. Awards include Crane's Detroit Business 40 Under 40 and the GLEQ Spirit of Entrepreneurship. She is an MFA from Columbia, studied at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program, and learned from her family of fruit peddlers, meat processors, restaurant owners, and wholesalers. Thank you, Danielle. Um, hey, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, and, and actually, it was really good to, have, to listen to what Laura was saying beforehand. So I'm just going to go through this very quickly. And you know, we all know that demand is exploding. It's in addition to sort of it being on Oprah and at the White House, state and local governments are promoting its economic benefits. The problem is, oops, let's see, oops. The problem is that <laughs> tools that many of us have to increase local food distribution are really out of date. Um, they're, they're, they're stuck in the 20th, 20th century. But this is changing. Yeah, many small businesses and have 
across different sectors have benefited from web-based services and networks. Um, and we're only just starting to see this happening with local food systems. Local Orbit has built a web platform that makes it easy for buyers and sellers to connect and most importantly to transact. And we adapt innovation from Amazon Marketplace and web services such as Salesforce to the needs of local food chains, opening new markets for small and mid-sized food producers. We've built uh, a back office in a box essentially for, for hubs that provides simple interfaces, e-commerce. We have complete payment management, credit card processing, invoicing, and we handle payments to producers. Inventory management, fulfillment and logistic tools, marketing, and then we also provide dedicated trackable customer service and issue resolution. If somebody has a problem with an order, we have a system in place to handle that call and track it and make sure it gets routed through the right person. Buyers get streamlined ordering and 24-7 convenience, and it's really easy to purchase from multiple vendors in a single shopping cart with a single payment. The service is designed to be quick uh, and easy for chefs and food service buyers, but people also have the opportunity to get more information if they want, and in addition to an overview page, each product has a detailed page with additional information. We have built-in marketing features, such as a, a weekly deal, which enables folks to move product or feature producers. And then each farmer has their own page with real-time inventory links, and we're adding Facebook and Twitter integration into this. Farmers retain their identity throughout the checkout process, and it's really a simple one-step checkout. Sites can be set up to take credit cards or to handle purchase orders. Sellers log in to a very simple dashboard. Their current sales and inventory status are front and center, and then they can dig into other information they need to run their business. Once a producer adds a product, they can easily change inventory and pricing on the fly. And sites can be set up, by the way, for retail pricing only, wholesale pricing only, or both. There's also a suite, oh, let's go back. There's, there's a suite of fulfillment tools. I think that slide didn't get put in here, Jeff. But anyways, there's a suite of fulfillment tools to make sure everybody knows what they're supposed to deliver with pick lists and, and uh, packing slips. So uh, hub managers have complete control over all the accounts on their hubs. If you don't want hub uh, farmer to manage their own account, you can handle that as well. So. You can also have multiple hubs, and that works for multiple pickup spots, where you can manage one hub or a network of hubs from a single dashboard. Basically, again, it, it provides one dashboard for all the needs of a manager of a hub in one place. The service is built for food hubs and farmers markets, and it's built for independent distribution entrepreneurs. Basically, it's a flexible system that can be adapted to different distribution models. There's enough commonality across the models that we've built a system that can be customized for each different need. Our business model is basically a transaction fee model and as a social venture 10% of our profits will go to a micro loan fund for producers in the network. We look at hubs and, and producers as partners. We share the startup risk, we take a, a, a transaction fee, and we use our profits to help producers build capacity. We're a facilitator, essentially. We know folks are already doing this, and people have robust relationships and networks. And what we've developed is what we see as a cost-effective, quick-to-launch approach that helps folks leverage the existing physical and resources and networks that they already have. And then additionally, individual markets on the platform can be linked, which really helps create a robust regional food system, and it offers diverse sales opportunities for producers. So in terms of longevity, we'll stick around because we have an experienced team and a flexible and responsive platform that's being built with user input at every step of the way. We're also building a system that can integrate with other platforms, including any of the other services that are part of this webinar, and I agree with what John was discussing. And this is really why I think we need to use the internet to help change the food system. 
because the basic business and business tools are essential, but it's the integration of information across platforms, the collaboration of many people building and using these services that's going to actually take us to scale as we work on changing the food system. I'm not talking about the scale of factory, farmer, or distributors. It's, it's online. It's the scale of many to many. So impact. Everyone joining us for this webinar knows how important it is to make local and sustainable food widely available and accessible. The impact is significant. One of the values of technology, however, is also its ability to use communications tools and data to reduce waste, which is crucial to the economic sustainability of local food enterprises as well as the environment. And there, there, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about this, but um, I would. I also want to um, just sort of point out that if we can generate sales data and do demand-driven planning and pre-ordering, we're going to reduce post-harvest waste. And as we use communications tools to leverage underutilized transportation resources for backhauling and sharing delivery routes, we'll also reduce waste and make this more cost-efficient. So again, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, and I'd be really happy to talk to you offline if we don't get to them in the Q&A, and I thank you. Thank you very much. And next we have uh, Kara Rosen from Real Time Farms, who is going to talk about tools for um, consumers, but actually also for producers and for restaurants. Um, Kara. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. You probably want to shake it off. I'm the last in line, and that can be, that can be tough. So, um, so what is this thing called realtimefarms.com with this tractor? Hopefully, people have seen maybe once. Um, Real Time Farms is a crowdsourced nationwide food guide. It's really simple. The, what we plan to do is make it really easy for all of us to know where our food comes from so that we can all find food that we feel really great about eating. What a concept. And of course, the problem is that people don't know what they're eating, and it's too hard to figure that out. So our hypothesis is that the more people know about the food they eat, the healthier, more sustainable choices they're going to naturally make. And of course, we think the key to that is to creating a non-judgmental, open, and engaging, colorful platform that um, really records every kind of producer and artisan, whether you be conventional, organic, um, or anything. It's important that we document everyone. So collectively, we think by having a crowdsource model, we're going to be able to tell the stories of every farm and food artisan. Crazy maybe, but we think it's possible. And our idea, of course, is that if you know farms and you know who produces it, how it's produced and where you can find it, then you really know food. And then you can find food that fits your values and that you feel fabulous about. So I'm just going to show you really briefly, this is the heart and soul of real-time farms, the food and, or the farm and food artisan profiles. And this is a farm profile for Tantre Farm back here in our hometown of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And you can see that, um, you can see pictures from the farm. You can read all about the farm, all their contact information. And then what's really cool too is that you can see where you can find their food at restaurants near you and at farmer's markets. And of course, all this data is being added to every day by people all over the country who are submitting it and submitting images um, from their both their computer and their smartphones. And what we quickly found was that people did not want to know just about where the food comes from um, that they eat at home, but they also wanted to know, how do I know where my food comes from when I go out to eat? And so we thought, OK, maybe we can create something. So basically, we have created a, a suite of tools for restaurants in order to tell the story of all of their ingredients. And so just to give you an example, um, here is the famed Zingerman's Roadhouse here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and you're getting a bird's eye view right now of all of their purveyors. And you can see right here that Pasta Martelli is sourcing, um, or they're sourcing from Pasta Martelli in nine of their menu items. So you're probably asking right now, this is a lot of data and how do we keep it up to date? So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But if you go from a bird's eye view to now their menu, you can now, rather than just seeing Nyman Ranch hot dogs or Nyman Ranch beef, um, you would actually be able to read about Nyman Ranch, see the pigs in the pasture, um, and read all about what they're being fed, 
and I can show you an example of that. So all, essentially they have linked all their menu items back to the purveyors that they came from. So here on the next slide is a picture of when you click on that fork, you're taken to then to back into the hub, the growing wealth of information and data on farms and food artisans, and you get to learn about Corman Farms and see the pictures of the pigs. All right, so the question was, how do we keep all this data live, fresh, exciting? Because oftentimes these are restaurants that are changing their menus um, you know, every few months, and in some cases, in their case, daily. So we realized that we really had to integrate with their system, and they had to be able to go into real-time farms and change all of the data, and then have the data show up in multiple places so that they didn't have to enter the data multiple times. So we realized that if we embedded it on their own website, all of a sudden they would have a ton more functionality. They'd be able to really show their commitment to their own values, whether that be local, sustainable, organic, whatever it might be, and communicate the stories, the richness, the excitement about food back to their customers in a very, very, very affordable way, something that would have cost many thousands of dollars for a developer to do. So now they're using Real-Time Farms as a whole menu management system. And so we've created something where food transparency is finally simple. All right, so back to the question. There's so much data, and how will we keep it all up to date? This is, we have to approach this problem from so many different ways. We've already heard from so many of the panelists about the importance of open data. We're going to be releasing our data with an open API. And of course, the more you share your data, the more people are committed to investing and contributing to it and keeping it exciting and up to date and accurate. Um, the other important thing is to create tools for users that encourage them to contribute that they rely on in some way. So for the restaurants, they want to keep all this information up to date. The farmers want to keep the information up to date because they know that the restaurants are relying on it. Um, and then the other thing that we sort of borrowed from Yelp is that you've got to prime regions. You've got to show people what does it mean to contribute to this? What does it mean to get involved in collecting all this data? So we started this Food Warrior program where every three months about 20 new food warriors uh, set their sites on different metropolitan areas across the United States, and they spend all their time documenting both in video and um, photos and growing practices information on the farms and food artisans in their area. And that program is ongoing. We actually just launched a new set of 17 about yesterday, I think, or two days ago. Um, another way that is really important is that we have partnerships with a lot of other organizations that have data. And we are very open to sharing and comparing the data and um, cross-promoting one another. That is really important to keeping all the data clean. Another piece that is really important to this is to reflect user contributions so that people get a sense of, yeah, I really am making a change. I'm making a difference. And it's really important to make it fun and make it colorful. Soon we're going to be um, integrating video into the site. And we already have a big collection of videos. We're partnering with a lot of great video people from across the country, some of the top food documentary people, to make it human, make technology exciting, and connect them back to what makes food awesome in the first place. So instead of going to the end here, I wanted to say that we're here to stay. We have a team. I'm, I co-found this with my husband, who's um, a former Google Android engineer. And we have awesome other engineers and people on our team. And so it's really cool to have developers as some of the main people on your team. Um, we already have a business model. We're already generating revenue. The business model is $40 a month subscription fee for all these tools for restaurants. It's free for everybody else. And that's really important to us, too. Um, since our launch, just to give you an idea of the restaurant software, the restaurant tools, about 18 weeks ago, we already have about 50 eateries that are using the software. Um, Mario Vitelli's um, sustainability group is really geeked about it. The White House actually give us permission to put up their state dinners and talk about where they're getting their food, Zingerman's Roadhouse, Equinox, and many, many, many more. So uh, we look forward to a, to a bright future. I should also add that I didn't add that we had $100,000 in angel investing, and we've been very much of the model of a lean startup. And so we attend, intend to likely keep our, our, our costs low and our impact high. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. And so that concludes the presentation um, portion of the webinar. Uh, next, we're going to move to your questions. So please feel free to um, send in questions. And I will be um, going through the question list and asking um, panelists. And if 
So we're not able to get, we won't be able to get to all of the questions, but um, we will be sure to respond uh, directly to those that are not answered. Um, to, I'm going to throw out one question uh, for clarification. Um, Kara, you were just talking about an API, um, and I wondered if you could explain what that means to everyone, and um, I guess generally for everyone, if there's a lot of talk about open data, so if you could talk a little bit more about what exactly you mean by open data um, and its importance, and more specifically how it impacts um, producers. Sure. Um, so an open API is an open application programming interface, which makes it sound so much sexier. <laughs> and um, essentially, it will be making, we don't know what subset of data will, it will likely be a very, very large subset of our data that will be available for developers to use. So I think, like, I, I'm, I'm not sure what, what, yeah, like Google has an API, for example. Laura of Idaho's Bounty, I know that you guys got started off with a, with a, a big chunk of data. And that data, we will be making available, all the stuff that we are collecting, we'll be making available for startups to use, like Idaho's Bounty, to um, start with and pull in. and. Uh, that's really exciting, and we've already talked with some, you know, food phone apps and things like that about doing that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, can uh, I jump in there? Yeah, sure. This is Erica. Um, so, so that's it's really great, actually, Kara, to hear that. And and you know, I I always I look at something online called the Small Business Web, and what what it is, it's a very good website to go to. I think it's smallbusinessweb.net. And it's, it's a bunch of small services using everything from constituent relation, contact relationship management to accounting to customer support tools, anything that you need to run a business. And all of the services talk to each other. And the, the data moves back and forth. We actually use a lot of services like that with open APIs to build local orbit, which is a more cost-effective and connective way to, to do that. The place that, as Kara said, you see it most often is you see a Google map everywhere. That That's pulling data between Google Maps and whatever the application is. And and I think the reality is, is and John referred to this, is nobody can solve any problem completely in its entirety on its own. And the services online that are working with APIs, and I know Julia has talked about that as well. We've talked about that with Julia with Ag Squared, is if you can have information that starts in one place and moves into other places, you never have to re-enter it again. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from um, the audience uh, to Karen, I guess really to, to all the presenters. Um, what needs to be done so that the data is shared more easily and quickly across the communities and the platforms, um, including those that don't directly relate to the food supply chain? This is John Bailey. I'd love to answer that one. Um, basically, GS1 standards, because the produce industry <coughs> is using them, there's a <coughs> group called Open Menu, um, which is doing this in restaurant menus already. They're not using GS1 standards. Uh, but basically what Open Menu does, I have no affiliation, is they put it in once and then it can update in all these different restaurant menus automatically. Well, what the, the mainstream produce industry is doing is they're using the GS1 numbers. So like if you see the little UPC number on the product or the data bar on the product, they input that information once and then they have uh, what they call data pools. And if you've got a GS1 certified data pool, that is verified data. Uh, and you can pull it up, and you know sometimes they'll charge a small fee for it. But you know something like Ag Squared could be a data pool, should be a data pool, and use the GS1 standard, and there you are. If, as long as they let, you know, they let people pull from it, they could charge for it. So on a little bit of a less technical um, level, what what practically would be need, would need to be done for us to get to that point where it's easy to do that? Well, it's not easy. You need, you need to have each grower accountable for their own data. And that for them to want to do it, they need to, I won't mention any names, but I know my growers say, well, I use such and such online service. And then I have to go and I have to input all my data again to go into this other online service because they're competing with each other. I wish I could put it in one thing and they could both pull. 
And so if you make it easy for the grower is what you need to do, because they're the one that has the access to the data. They'll use it if it's easy. Does anybody else want to respond to that? All right. Um, I so just, uh, Dan, only quickly, Daniel, actually, I think that the, that it's a conversation that, as a food community, that I know you guys are starting on Food Tech Connect. We need to do more of it. I think it's a really important thing to sort of bring everybody together and see if we can find a way to support that dialogue. Because I think it's complicated. Yes, it's immensely complicated. And I, I think that there are, across many different verticals, there are people that are trying to figure out how exactly to do this. The food supply chain is particularly challenging because there are so many different actors. And the, the data is locked up in so many different databases, and it's in so many different formats. Um, and I know from the conversations that I have with people that it really hampers you know, innovation and transparency and really the ability to, to build um, the platforms that you guys are all building that are, offer an, um, uh, an immense amount of value to producers and to consumers. Um, but, and that's something that we're very committed to doing is to holding um, dialogue through events and online conversations to, to figure out the best way to come up with making it easier to connect information. Um, well, I, I can say that my, my company's working with the group at University of Oklahoma. They just got funded by the USD to do exactly that thing. So, um, you know, people are doing it. I oh, mean, yeah. it's, it's happening right now. They're doing it. And so there's a lot of different people that are doing it. It's just find the one that's going to rise to the top, I guess. Right. Yes, I agree. Um, this is oh, – go ahead. Sorry, this is Julia. I just wanted to add in that it's exactly these kind of conversations that will allow us to better understand uh, what data are really of value that need to be shared throughout the system. You know, what's relevant, for example, on the farm, then to the food hub, then to the consumer, and, you know, where that chain needs to, um, where the links in the chain need to all be connected. So this is the kind of conversation that really allows us as Ag Squared, for example, to understand understand, you know, what data are of value. Obviously, if we make it easy for the grower to um, plan and manage their operation and keep track of records, for example, harvest records, production records, then um, it seems to us that, that we do uh, hold quite a bit of data in our databases that could be of value to many of the, uh, of, of the other uh, folks who are presenting here today, but also to others who, you know, aren't on this panel. Um, to and it's, it's, yeah. So it would be it would be good for for us at least as AgSquare to understand um, you know what what data food hubs are looking for what would be of value to them and I use that term kind of loosely to sort of describe uh, many of the different downstream um, applications or I'd sorry downstream the, partners. the sustainability index because they're putting that together because that's addressing what the buyers are asking for what the wholesale buyers are asking for. So if you can answer those things, if you just Google sustainability index, they have specific things they're looking for. Um, Danielle, I'd love to step in. Sure. Um, I guess I guess what we feel like is first the first step to all of this is to for all of us to make our data available in some sort of format. So, for example, we just um, pulled in the U.S. market data dump. Um, that wasn't initially in the most accessible format, so it took a lot of scrubbing and things like that, but it was still really immensely helpful. And I think to that end, we want our data to be available to programmers. So if more and more guides make the data available, then we can start to see some commonality and perhaps could come up with some standards. But I think it'd be great for first for all of us to allow our data to be open so that then we could see what variables we're working with and what really matters across all these different platforms and then agree on a standard. Hmm. Um, I think Kara, that that's a great idea in terms of the directories and the, the, it gets a little more challenging when you've got people who want to hold on to their business information. So it's just sort of looking at how you create access to information um, while not sort of say sharing somebody's sales numbers and things like that is the sort of questions that we're starting to ask. Um, so I think, it's, I think that we can differentiate between 
the kind of directories and um, guides that Real Time Farm is doing and maybe some of the transactional platforms and just trying to figure out sort of the balance between those for, this, for the comfort factor of the users. Because I think the other thing that we find is, you know, farmers, there's all kinds of stories, farmers aren't going to get online. They get online and they use technology, but people are very cautious. And so we're also dealing with the, the nature of the field that we're in and who our users are as well. That's an excellent segue into another question um, that a number of people have asked, which is how um, you are dealing with issues of in, um, access to the internet um, and um, smartphones. So there's a lot of farmers that don't have access um, to either of those things, and people are curious how you, how you guys are dealing with that and what are the other ways that someone could access your services. Yeah, if I could, like, uh, this is exactly why we made it crowdsourced, so it doesn't rely on the producer getting online and f filling out all this information. And so for us, it's just been really important that we can all rally and share, you know, what we know about these farms and producers. And having looked at models like Wikipedia and things like that, we realized that crowdsourced models can actually be really accurate. Um, so, I mean, I... I mean, obviously, we're big proponents of that. But I think what's interesting is that all, all the people on the panel are doing such very different things. <laughs> and, and some of them probably couldn't be that model. Um, but for us, that's been really important. Um, I can, this is Eric, I can jump in. So we've been dealing with that in a couple of ways. The first one is, you know, our, our, our first customer is the hub manager. So it's really the, the food hub or the farmer's market or the manager of a co-op that comes to us and we set up the system for them. And so so in, in many cases there may be a farmer that doesn't have access or doesn't have good access to the internet and we've built the tools so that the hub manager can completely take care of an account and the farmer can call it in. And it's also why we have a call-in number um, through customer service because we can help as well. But the long-term solution is getting involved in conversations about broadband access, obviously, and um, increasingly developing more phone-based tools. And they don't only have to be smartphone-based tools. There's really interesting work that's being done specifically in Africa connecting farmers with markets, and they use text messaging. And we're trying to figure out how you, how you handle the balance between that sort of straightforward transactional stuff and the kind of storytelling and transparency and sort of rich interfaces that uh, folks in our markets are looking for from the buyer side. That's a really excellent example. Uh, it's, yeah, it, you can get a lot done with, with text messaging. I mean, I basically developed a, a multi-year project with U.S. and South African artists in the mid and late 90s and we communicated only through text messaging. I was working with folks in rural villages who would go and somebody would have a car battery that would be the village charging station and people would pay them a small amount of money so they could keep their phones charged. And we planned and managed really big projects that way. So it's possible. Wow. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> this is John Bailey. Efresh, uh, the .com, they did a thing in India where basically they would send text messages for how much nitrogen to put on a particular plant. They work with really small scale growers and they have a white paper somewhere published about it. Efresh.com. Okay. Um, so the next question is about, um, for, ag for uh, real time farms actually, um, about how you verify the accuracy of the information if you're not getting it directly from the producer. Sure. Um, well, the, the quick and easy answer is we don't really. I mean, I think, I think with all crowdsource models, you're dealing with um, the ability for the, you know, some of the information to become inaccurate. But we have never, in, we, we look through all the data that is entered, at least all of the images and things like that. And we have yet to come across um, something that is uh, not right, besides like a time of a market or something like that that we need to change. Um, one of the ways that we, one of the ways that we intend on building is a similar flagging system, 
um, and other moderation tools that consumers can use and anybody on the site. So that means farmer fooders and farmer's market manager, anybody can use to um, flag the information as inaccurate. Um, and we also have the ability to be able to roll back changes when um, we see that something has been done inaccurately. One of the good things is, is that, um, for example, with restaurant data, when we get information about where they're sourcing, the sources are then contacted and we can then get information of, yes, we do actually source to them or no, we haven't in three months and that's not right. And so then we have to go back to the restaurant and talk. But it's, you know, what do you do with crowdsource models and how do you manage all that is oftentimes with a general moderating and flagging systems. So we are in the middle of putting those together. Thank you. Uh, so this question was for Julia, but I think that it can actually answer everyone. Um, it's a question about the training plan um, for producers and how, how you plan on working with them to um, educate them about using the tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, well, I think there's, there's two things that I, um, that we should bring up that we're doing for Ag Squared. The first is that we're designing the software to be intuitive and easy to use. And I think that that's really a very important first step in making it um, accessible to producers at different levels and skill um, in using software and technology. I think also that the fact that, that our software does run online helps to um, make it somewhat easier to use. It reduces a lot of the questions that folks have with regards to compatibility uh, with different operating systems and different computers. So um, that's one aspect that's, you know, sort of in the engineering and the building of the product. The other um, source that we're really relying on in terms of helping get growers up to speed in using Ag Squared is the community. Um, we believe that for, for growers to adopt our technology and successfully and to, to really bring about the large change that we're talking about here today in the food system, it requires in a sense, community support. Um, a grower needs to have seen another grower adopt the software, needs to be reassured in his or her adoption of the software uh, because they receive the support of farm support organizations or cooperative extension or other education programs. So in order to help build that community, what we've done with Ag Squared is we've designed a forum system and we built and have been using that during our beta test as a way for growers to communicate with each other and ask questions of each other. And it's proven to be really successful. It's um, a lot of great feature suggestions have come through the forum system. Um, so we're, we're really uh, looking at, at community support as the way to, um, to help, help growers help each other, basically. OK, thank you. And anybody else? Have you? Only that um, that ultimately the issue of training is often a function of bad usability, bad design, and that I would say that we do need uh, the, our hub managers need a little more training than the the producers, and certainly buyers shouldn't need any training. But that that the the better your interfaces are, the less training required. It doesn't mean that you won't need to work with folks for them to understand the processes and the standards and, and the sort of business processes. But the technology, you know, I won't say that we've done it perfectly, but we're working toward making it completely intuitive. And I think that we, you know, it's really important as you work with users who aren't the early adopters in technology to understand that a lot of training on complex programs is a usability question as much as just technology in and of itself. Thank you. Um, and this question is for Laura. Um, so you use the um, OK Food co-op software for a few years now. Um, how is it holding up as your co-op is growing? Um, we've continued to help develop it throughout the years. Um, some generous grants have helped that. Um, we, like I said, we are currently actually doing some research on other models, such as local orbit, local dirt. Um, and other options that may be out there to see what maybe um, might better fit our business model. We're finding that the multiple delivery days per week um, is really becoming difficult with the Oklahoma model, um, but we've been able to effectively use it for the last four years. 
Um, so I think it's a really, really great option for um, a small co-op starting um, to get off the ground. But as we continue to grow um, and need these other options, we're finding that it doesn't fully support all of those other ideas. Can I ask you a question, Laura? How much you said you've done a lot of customization of of the software, and is that all customization that you've then put back into the open source repository, or is it very specific to Idaho? Nope, it's it's definitely gone back into that open source code. Um, we, you know, some of them have been, um, yeah, not a little bit specific to us, but most of them have have been all put back in, um, just kind of easier usability, better options for producers. Um, that sort of thing. And we did help put into place the option to list products um, either as retail or as wholesale. Great. And Erica, um, have you thought at all about um, doing any kind of collaboration with Local Dirt? Yeah, we have, it hasn't come up. We haven't, we haven't spoken, um, but we would certainly consider the conversation. We're just, you know, we're just beginning to move out of our testing and our pilot mode and actually launching, you know, new sites this year. So, so we're definitely at a place where it would be interesting to have those kinds of conversations. Okay. This is John um, Bailey. I, I have tried Local Dirt's fantastic, but the difficulty is everybody wants to kind of own the grower, you know, and nobody really owns the grower. So that's the difficulty is to use the local dirt system, it's suddenly like you're out of the equation. The system's fantastic, but that doesn't really help if, you know, now you're you're not able to you know continue to work with that group that you've developed. What do you mean own the grower? Well, everybody's interested in um, in being the place that people come and see the grower's information. Um, I'm just going to say local harvest because they're fantastic, but you know local harvest has a proprietary system. So local harvest wouldn't want to have that grower be able to list in local dirt with one listing. You know they'll see themselves as competitors. There's nothing wrong with it. It's natural, but it just doesn't really help the grower to to feel like well they've got to choose a system or they've got to input the data in every single solitary system because we don't even take a, a part of the sale. But it would just be nice for the grower to be able to put data in one place and have it go to multiple places. That makes a lot of sense, John. Um, and and because I actually think in the end, it's you know, it's it's the buyers that you have to pay attention to. So the, if the grower can have one place where they put their information, and then it can go to multiple channels through multiple distribution channels, then they're going to benefit and everybody's going to benefit. All of it, Everyone's data is going to be much more robust and then it's just a question of the different places the buyers go to. And, and I think everybody has a slightly different approach. We have a very localized approach where you, you, you don't go to a national database and see what's available. You go to a local market that, that has been put together by folks who are working on building a hub or again a farmer's market or a co-op and in a way it's their curated producers and it's their standards that you can trust because they don't allow, they have to accept and, and vet producers before they get into the market and the value of that is that you get another layer of accountability and, trans, and, and transparency but at the same time Somebody could easily go and order from other producers on um, local harvest, local dirt, any of the other sites, market maker, and, and I think that there's a lot of value to that for the farmer especially. But the truth is the, the, the buyers, the buyers, like the, the big wholesale buyers that a lot of the you know, growers that are kind of getting to the midsize need to sustain themselves, they will only look at things in like an iTrade, I don't know if it's iTrade, but you know what I mean, they use the, the GS1 number. You know, they use that common ordering scheme. So if you put in it, put things in any database that doesn't use that same data format, you have to put it in again to get in front of the buyers. You have to, because your database won't update automatically. The only way it updates to, and I don't necessarily agree that's the way it should be, but that's the way it is. Um, the only way it'll update to a GS1 system is if you've got some way in your system to translate your number into a GS1 number so you can send it over to that system that speaks that language. It's almost like they, there's no way around using the GS1 system if you want to put it in one place, if you don't want to input it separately in every different database. 
and get your data stale. I mean, that's even almost worse is to have, you know, bad pricing somewhere. I think it's a, this is a big conversation that would, that is obviously this webinar doesn't have time for, but I think that one of the questions that, that we ask a lot is how much do we build a system and ask small producers to adopt the, the, the existing practices and processes and how much do we um, disrupt them enough where it can accommodate the unique characteristics and stories of local farms and local food systems. And I think that, that the answer is there's like a middle ground. So I, I think that's another, that's another topic for another time. Yeah. It, is, it is another topic, but it's, it's actually really important. It's a question that um, another, a number of people have been asking is, you know, there's this cultural shift of a producer being at the computer. So even that in and of itself is a disruption. Um, so, you know, how, how are you guys dealing with that? Uh, Our vision is that the producer won't need to be at the computer. That's not 100% true right now, but it'll be on a handheld device. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's where we will be. And, and because that's true, and that's true of a chef as well. I'll tell you, we've got growers in Salinas Valley. They don't have email, but their kids come in and they go to the library and they update. I mean, they literally do not have an email address, and if they're still in the program. If there's a market, they do it. If they see return on their investment, people people do it. How are you, you know? demonstrating return on their investment? Sales. Sales. So I mean, that's that's the most direct ROI you can see. That I mean, that's why we think it's important to have the transactions tied up in you know part of the system because that's how you can demonstrate it. We had a guy in our program that said he'd never, never, never do it. He got a big sale, and I saw it was all caps. He'd gone in and he typed in there. He, just, he was saying thank you to the guy that bought it, but it was like he decided, hey, this works. I'm going in. I'm going to put it in there. It's funny. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm jumping in. We, we're already over time, um, and so um, in addition to all of our wonderful panelists, Erica, John, Laura, Kara, and Julia, I want to give a big thank you to our moderator today, Danielle Gould. She did a wonderful job, and I want to thank you all for for staying on for extra time. Um, we are recording the this webinar, um, and uh, we post it on. Uh, www.ngfn.org uh, slash webinars. Um, it should be up there within uh, a few business days. We do have webinars every third Thursday of the month. Uh, the next two webinars uh, are uh, in October. We're having a really cool webinar. Uh, Food Hub Financing work Workshop is our working title. We're going to have three food hubs uh, present their story uh, to a panel of uh, professional uh, fundraisers, basically, and funders uh, uh, from federal and uh, private uh, funding sources, and uh, they will advise these three hubs on uh, what sorts of uh, grants uh, to apply for and how to do so. Um, speaking of which, if you would like to be one of those funds getting this essentially free technical assistance, uh, fill out uh, that portion of our post-webinar survey. Uh, and in November 17th, uh, we look at uh, two other web-based tools. Uh, for beginning farmers. Uh, Farm Credit Council uh, and FamilyFarm.org recently launched uh, interesting tools uh, trying to solve two of the most uh, difficult problems for uh, growers. In fact, Julia mentioned them. Um, one is creating the business side uh, and the other is uh, food safety. So two interesting tools. So if you're into food and tech, uh, come again in November. Uh, we have uh, WWF foodhub.info, uh, a food hub hub uh, listing a bunch of food hubs. We will uh, have a map there, a Google map using an API, um, and uh, we will be continually uh, keeping that up to date as well as uh, resources for food hubs and people interested in food hubs. And our Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center has a relatively new website all about the program, but also a fantastic library of many of the best food access uh, resources out there. That is also continually updating.
Uh, a few partner announcements. October is National Farm to School Month. Get more information uh, and resources at farmtoschoolmonth.org. The Nish Meat Processing Assistant Network is uh, having a web webinar on the 28th um, to build or not to build his new processor uh, really net needed uh, in an area and you don't, you don't need to register uh, just write down uh, or copy that uh, web address and join at the appropriate time uh, and slow money's third national gathering in San Francisco is uh, October 12 to 14 more information at slowmoney.org uh, the uh, NGFN uh, is on YouTube. Uh, you can connect with us on Twitter. Uh, email us, contact at ngfn.org, and um, look up and add your name to our database of technical assistance providers and others interested in good food. Um, you can uh, sign up for our emails at uh, ngfn.org. You can always uh, email us, contact at ngfn.org. Uh, and if, you, if you'd like to uh, either be registered for the next uh, upcoming webinars or get automatically added to our uh, email list, uh, fill out that post-webinar survey. Um, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful webinar, and we will see you again next week. Bye-bye. The organizer has ended.